Okay. Welcome to another terrific program at the Merowith Center. Thanks for joining us. I'm Laura Bryant. Today, we're talking about the 2023 season at the New Jewish Theater. And we're introducing, very proud to introduce, the new artistic director, Rebecca Scallett, who's been in her position since August, not very long. And she is ready to talk about the new program and what's in store for 2023, drama, comedy, and music. This program is uh, co-sponsored by Merowith Center and the New Jewish Theater, and it's located in the Jay's Arts and Education Building. Hi. So please welcome Rebecca, and uh, thank you, Rebecca, for sharing uh, all of your insights, and uh, please uh, know that we are very excited to have you today. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here with all of you, and I, I appreciate you. You all joining me for an hour um, to learn about what we've got coming up at the New Jewish Theater this year. Um, I am, like Laura said, I'm I'm still pretty new, uh, just a few months at the New Jewish Theater. And I thought I'd take a moment before I start talking about the season to just introduce myself to you a little bit. Um, I have lived in St. Louis for two years now, though my parents are both born and raised in St. Louis. And my grandparents are here. My family goes back here actually several several generations. So St. Louis was always a second home to me, but my family had moved away when I was really small. We moved to Little Rock, Arkansas when I was seven years old. And that's where I grew up. Um, and then I went to Brandeis University for my undergraduate degree and majored in theater and English. I love reading and literature and books as, as well as the theater. And then I moved to Chicago and I worked in theater there before going to Illinois State University where I got my uh, Master of Fine Arts in directing for the theater. And that led me to doing a lot of work with Shakespeare. There's, um, some of you might be aware, there's the Illinois Shakespeare Festival, which is located there in um, normal Illinois, not too far away from here, like two and a half hours. So a fun summer, summer adventure. Um, and so I worked there for many summers uh, and then was hired to go back to Arkansas to run the Arkansas Shakespeare Theater. So I was the producing artistic director of the Arkansas Shakespeare Theater for nine years uh, up until 2020. So <laughs> as we all know, many, many things changed in 2020, including a big life change for me of moving to St. Louis. Um, and so, so as I said, I've been here for two years and I had been doing some freelance work around town. Uh, I directed for the conservatory at Webster University uh, did some other Shakespeare Festival circuit things. And um, when the opportunity came up at New Jewish Theater, I was in the right place at the right time um, to take on this, this wonderful position of artistic director of uh, a really amazing theater. Um, the more I've learned about it, the more, the more amazed I am, <laughs> I have to say. It's been around for 25 years, which is a long time for a theater. Um, to make it and uh, to be a theater that is dedicated to Jewish works um, that explore the Jewish experience uh, at, or, or look at things through a Jewish lens, I think is really also pretty special. And um, uh, being Jewish, I, I was raised Jewish and, and still, still practice today um, to be able to bring my Judaism to my theatrical work has been, has been new and really exciting. So, so I'm happy about that opportunity as well. Um, so I've got a PowerPoint and I'm going to talk about a few other things. I thought we would start with, let's see if I can get it to work. There we go. Um, talking about the mission of the new Jewish theater. Um, and so I'll just, I'll read it for you because I think it's really good. The new Jewish theater is dedicated to exploring Jewish themes and celebrating Jewish writers while examining the full range of the human experience. We present universal work through a Jewish lens using our productions to enrich lives, promote inclusivity and build community. And um, we're very proud to be a part of the Jewish Community Center. Uh, and I think that uh, the pieces of the, the, the Jays mission really are part of our mission, including the enriching lives, promoting inclusivity and building community. And I think theater um, is actually a really unique tool to be able to achieve those things because uh, we are storytellers. And when people come to the theater, we invite you into a world that is different than your everyday world and one that you might not know. And I think it's such a wonderful way 
to walk around in someone else's shoes and whether it's uh, a, a Jewish someone else or maybe um, someone you know from the Bronx in New York living a very different life than yours, theater allows us to uh, look at the world through their eyes for a little while and I think has um, a wonderful ability to build empathy and understanding about, about different cultures and different people and different ideas. Uh, and that's something that is that is important in what the New Jewish Theater does. So I think you'll see, I'm gonna talk about our five plays that we have coming up in our 2023 season. And I think they all do that and are related to this mission um, in, in some different ways. Uh, I also, I do wanna point out that I am not responsible for selecting most of these plays. Um, my predecessor, who many of you may have known, um, Edward Caulfield or Eddie, um, picked the plays before he left and I've had to do a little bit of tinkering with it but for the most part this is his season um and I'll get to choose my own first season starting in 2024 so I when I'm talking about the plays I don't know exactly why Eddie chose them but I can tell you the things that I find unique or interesting about them how they relate to our mission and what you might take away from them I don't like it when I use that there we go so the first play of our season is Broadway Bound uh, it is by the great Neil Simon and directed by Alan Knoll, and it runs January 19th through February 5th. So it opens actually in just a few weeks, and we started rehearsals for it this past Monday. So we're already in rehearsal. Things are well underway. Um, this is actually the second time the New Jersey Theater has produced Broadway Bound. So some of you might remember the other production. It was in 2007, and it actually uh, starred Kathleen Sitzer, who was our founding artistic director. She was in it as the mother, um, Kate. She played that role. Um, and it's uh, also, it's, it's the third play in Neil Simon's, what's sometimes called his Eugene trilogy or the Brighton Beach trilogy. So he wrote three plays that are basically explore his childhood and growing up and how he got into the creative world and comedy. So um, the first play in that series is um, Brighton Beach Memoirs, um, which some of you may have seen. We've done that at New Jewish Theater as well a couple of times, most recently in 2019. Um, and uh, it was made into a movie starring Matthew Broderick. These photos are actually from the original Broadway production in 1983 that Matthew Broderick was also in. He was so cute and he was 19 years old in this play. Um, one of my one of my favorite actors, uh, but he became very closely associated with this character of Eugene Jerome. And the first play takes place in um, it's 1939, 1940, and Eugene's just 14 years old. And it sort of follows him um, as he's growing up and discovering girls, and also discovering that he wants to be a writer. And then it also tells the story of his family living during the Depression, living in this house in, in Brighton Beach in Brooklyn. Um, multiple families living together, taking care of each other, how hard that is, and also having to deal with um, having family in Poland that they're trying to get out and, and get to come to the United States. So that all happens in, in the first play, um, uh, Bright Brighton Beach Memoirs. Now, as I said, all three of these plays are sort of loosely based on Neil Simon's own childhood. He didn't grow up in Brighton Beach, but he did grow up in Brooklyn. Um, and they loosely based on events of his childhood and his own story, though um, he has he's made things a little prettier than I think they were in real life. He often said he had a really difficult childhood um, with his parents fighting a lot and uh, a, and a lot of challenges. So a little a little glossy, but but based on reality. So um, the next play in the series is Biloxi Blues. This is one we actually have not done at the New Jewish Theater yet. Um, I'm not sure why, maybe too many, too many young men, I don't know, um, but it is, uh, takes place, it kind of moves away, so the first play and the third play both take place in the same house in Brighton Beach. This one takes place in um, a boot camp in Biloxi, Mississippi, where the young Eugene is sent once he joins the army, and it is, uh, has to do, again, more like coming of age, continuing to grow up, um, but also having to deal with this outside world and the and this military style world for the first time as he's still wanting to be a writer and and exploring comedy and doing all of these things um, against the backdrop of of the war and training for the war. 
Um, this again, starred, as you can see here, starred Matthew Broderick. He did it on Broadway in 1985. And then a few years later was also uh, in the film in 1988. And that brings us to the third and final play of the trilogy, which is Broadway Bound. Um, these photos are from the original Broadway production, which appeared in 1986. And you might recognize Jason Alexander over here, this guy with the tie. Um, who later became famous in, on Seinfeld. Uh, he played Eugene's older brother, Stanley, in this production. Um, and once you see our production, you'll see why Jason Alexander is such a great fit for that role. It really, <laughs> there's a lot of similarities with, uh, with George Costanza. Um, <laughs> but uh, so, and then Jonathan Silverman is the young man here. He took over, I guess, maybe Matthew Broderick was too old at that point, um, but he took over as Eugene in this production um, that, that appeared on Broadway. And so this play takes the Jerome family to, and Eugene specifically, we go back to their home in Brighton Beach. Um, it's 1949, so it's after World War II and there's been some new prosperity that has come to the house um, as, as happened to many homes in the United States following the war. So they don't have the same struggles with, um, with money and finances, but they have struggles with, with change now. Um, and so uh, uh, Eugene and his brother Stanley want to be comedy writers. They're working on comedy together and they get a big break where they have a, a, a sketch that they wrote that is premiered on a CBS radio show, um, live sketch radio show. And that leads to them getting more work and making ultimately making the decision to move out of their home. And at the same time, uh, their parents, Jack and Kate, are really fighting all the time and having a lot of problems and uh, their marriage is kind of falling apart. So the play was very funny, um, has a lot of humor and a lot of warmth, but also has a lot of uh, serious things going on. There's definitely dramatic moments. Um, and that's true of a lot of Neil Simon plays, really. I think he is known as um, a comic writer, mostly. We tend to think of him as being a comedian and even sometimes as being sort of like a lowbrow comedian, like sticky jokes and not like really sophisticated kind of humor. Um, but, but many of his plays, and especially this Eugene trilogy, have a wonderful blend of the dramatic and the humorous. Um, and he actually, I found this great quote when I was researching this. He said, um, when I was writing plays, I was almost always, with some exceptions, writing a drama that was funny. I wanted to tell a story about real people. My view is how sad and funny life is. I can't think of a humorous situation that does not involve some pain. I used to ask, what is a funny situation? Now I ask, what is a sad situation and how can I tell it humorously? So I think that really, to me, that like, very much sums up kind of how Broadway Bound is, that we do have some sadness, um, some difficulties in, these, in this family's life, but it is told very humorously. Um, Broadway Bound was nominated for several Tony Awards, including um, Best Play for 1987. And so I have a little clip to play with you uh, from that 1987 Broadway production with uh, Jonathan Silverman and Linda Lavin. So we're going to see how this works with playing a clip. It'll give you just a little sense of, of the play. Kind of fun, 1987 Tony Awards. <laughs> Nominees for Best Play began in such diverse arenas as Broadway, Off-Broadway, Regional Theatre, and London's West End. Tonight, we'll be seeing moments from each of them. Actually, the first of these plays began over 40 years ago in a house in Brooklyn. Broadway Bound is the final chapter of Neil Simon's trilogy based on his own early years. Jonathan Silverman is the author's young alter ego, and Linda Lavin is heroic mother in this gift from a writer generous enough to look back on his life and see not just himself, but all of us. Come on. What are you doing? Are you crazy sitting on my dining room table like that? I'm sorry. 
I didn't leave any marks. Marks I can clean off. I never want to see you show disrespect to this table. My grandfather made this table with his own hands for my grandmother. Over 52 years, she had this table. When I was a little girl, I'd go to her house. She'd let me help her polish it. I didn't know it was work. I thought it was fun. Maybe because she and I did it together. Yeah. When she died, she left a will. She gave away dresses, jewelry, even a little cash. But she knew what I wanted. The table you eat on means everything. It's the one time in the day the whole family is together. This is where you share things. People who eat out all the time don't get to be a family. When I'm gone, if you and your Josie get married, this will be your table. Maybe you'll let me polish it with you one day. No. When your wife has a little girl, send her over. She and I will polish it. Maybe we'll have twins. You can polish it twice as fast. <laughs> twins? What are you like that? You make me nervous. I'm not following you. I just feel like talking. Talking? I love it when you tell me about the old days. The old days? I don't even remember them anymore. They were such a long time ago. Well, you just told me about the dining room table. That was a long time ago. Uh, that's it. What was your grandmother like? Hmm. Tiny. Little bit of a thing. All the women were small in those days, but when I was nine years old, I was bigger than she was. My grandfather had to pick her up to see the Statue of Liberty. <laughs> Must have been some day. <laughs> this is what they dreamed of all their life to get to America. And when they saw that statue, they started to cry. The women were wailing. The men were shaking. Everybody praying. You know why? Because they were free. Because they took one look at that statue and said, this is not a Jewish woman. We're going to have problems again. So there's a, a little taste of, of Broadway Bound um, from the Broadway production. And, and uh, you sort of see that, that classic Neil Simon humor in there. But you also see... You know he's getting at some some serious issues um, in there as well, and, and as also speaking to these family connections. So you'll see that all of those kinds of things in our production. Um, and then this is I just wanted to kind of share this with you. So we, as I mentioned, we did Brighton Beach Memoirs in 2019, um, and because it was so recent, we were able to bring back much of that same team that did, that worked on Brighton Beach Memoirs for us. So including our set designers. Marjorie and Peter Spack. So on the left, you'll see the, the set that we use for Brighton Beach memoirs of, of the home of the Jeromes. And then on the right is how we're kind of updating it a little bit um, for Broadway Bound. So it's the same set and the same structure. They've revisited um, some of the colors of the walls and making a few changes. Not all the changes they're making are in here, but you can see one big change is that um, Brighton Beach Memoirs took place in the fall and Broadway Bound takes place in the winter. So we're adding some, some snow and some elements to the outdoor things. And you'll see some other sl small things have changed to bring in um, the idea of the post-war prosperity that's come into their house. Um, and in addition to the SPACs, we have Michelle Seiler, who is our resident costume designer, um, who is doing the costumes for the show. And she also did them for Brighton Beach. We have the same director, Alan Knoll, and then the same performers uh, who played Eugene and Stanley, the brothers, as well as their father, Jack, they're all coming back. So there's kind of some fun continuity between that production of Brighton Beach Marmars and Broadway Bound. All right, so then the next show uh, is Every Brilliant Thing, which is written by Duncan McMillan with Johnny Donahoe. Um, Johnny Donahoe is actually the actor who originated the show. It's a, a one man play. Um, and, uh, and he was the first actor to do it. And then it's directed by Ellie Schwedy, who some of you might be familiar with. Um, she is the artistic director of SATE, um, slightly askew theater ensemble here in St. Louis. And she's directed for New Jewish Theater before. Um, and uh, so Every Brilliant Thing began as, actually it, it started off as a short story that Duncan McMillan wrote. Um, 
to be sort of a monologue for a friend of his. And the concept was there is a little boy who, um, whose mother is, uh, struggles with depression and has attempted suicide. Um, which is a pretty dark place to begin a story, but but ends up being really beautiful. And what this little boy does is he decides to make a list of everything that is brilliant in the world to share with his mother. Um, and the show takes you through all of the things that, that are on that list. Um, now, as I said, this started with a short story. The original short story was called Sleeve Notes, um, referring to the records and the and the record sleeves. His father, the boy's father, is uh, uh, obsessed with records and often it talks about reading everything on the sleeve notes. Um, and uh, it was performed as a monologue for years of different people. But eventually, uh, he got together with Johnny Donahoe and they had the idea of turning it into a full length play. Um, it was originally performed at the Ludlow Fringe Festival in the UK, and then since then. Um, Donahoe and Macmillan have taken it all over the world. It's toured everywhere. Um, it just recently in the last few years became available to license for other people to do it. And since then it also has exploded. It's just been a really popular play. Um, and I think be, it's again about, there's something very serious of dealing with the, the issues of depression and suicide, um, but it does it with, with tons of humor and tons of heart. Um, and also in a very theatrical way, um, I'm going to share you with you just a little clip that they, it was, uh, there was an HBO documentary about this play. And so you get to see a little bit of this original production, but you get to see how imaginative it is. It's very simple and sparse. Um, the writers dictate that you should not have a set um, or props. It's all about the storytelling, the storyteller and different things. Uh, there's also a lot of audience participation involved, so so be aware if you come, you may be asked to participate. Um, uh, of different members will read items on the list or even step in and become characters in the story. So it very much asks you to be present, to to be willing to suspend your disbelief and engage in the magic of of the theater. So I'm going to share a little bit with you. use my HBO subscription to its full, full effect. The list began after her first attempt. A list of everything that was brilliant about the world. Everything that was worth living for. Number one? Ice cream. <laughs> Number two? Water fights. Number three? Staying up past your bedtime and being allowed to watch TV. Absolutely. Number four. The color yellow. The color yellow. Number five. Things with stripes. <laughs> Number six. Roller coasters. Number seven. People falling over. Absolutely. <laughs> All things that at seven years old I thought were really brilliant, but not necessarily things that my mum would have agreed with. It was the 9th of November, 1987. I'm seven years old and I'm standing outside the school gates waiting to be picked up. And up until this moment, my only experience of death my entire life is that of my dog, Sherlock Bones. <laughs> and Sherlock Bones was older than me, and he was a central part of my existence, and he'd always been there, but he was sick. He was really sick. In fact, he was so sick that the vet came to put him down. Now, I hope you don't mind. I'm actually going to ask you to play the vet, is that okay? It's just you've got a very immediately veterinary quality. <laughs> about, I'm not sure what the, do you, are you a vet? Ben? No? no? Okay, fine. Um, I've not been right yet, but it could one day happen. So you're gonna be the vet, okay? So if you don't mind, could you just stand for me? And can I borrow your big coat? Yes. Great, okay. So you're the vet, okay? And I'm me as a seven-year-old boy, and this here, oh, this, this is little Sherlock Bones. And um, do you know what? I already know you, actually, because you're one of the mums from school. And I've seen you come to pick your girl up. And um, when I see you, you say something immediately kind and reassuring, like, you're doing the right thing. It's not a moment too soon. You're doing the right thing. It's not a moment too soon. Yeah, and I don't know what that means. I'm seven. <laughs> I don't know sense of finality or infinity. But what I do know straight away, what's really clear to me, is that you are very clearly a lovely person. 
And so I'm very relaxed around you. And um, do you have on you a pen or maybe a pencil? Yes. Okay. Great. Okay, so that pen there, that's the needle. <clears throat> and inside that needle is a drug called pentobarbital. And the dose is strong enough to render the dog unconscious and put him to sleep and depress his little brain and his respiratory system forever. So when you're ready, I want you to come over and you're going to inject Sherlock Bones in the thigh. This thigh hurts. <laughs> now, I'm going to stop. You are doing brilliantly. It's really fantastic. I'm surprised you haven't done any vet work. But what? <laughs> just one note, just one. And that's when you're putting down the beloved dog of a small boy, you really shouldn't smile. Like, I mean, it really. You see how it, I mean, it really changes the tone of the, the euthanasia no longer seems kind uh, if you're enjoying it. Should we, um, let's do it again. Let's go back to your mark. Let's get this right. I mean, this is, this is pretty important. So we need to get this just right. Okay, so. Um, Ooh, take press the wrong breath. button. Sorry, press the wrong pause there. <laughs> um, so you get a sense of every brilliant thing from that little clip. Um, and I, it's very moving. I, I could tell a few of you were moved from watching it. Um, and, and, and again, I think that is very much the tone of the show where it's very moving, but also very funny. And, um, and at the end, it's a very uplifting experience. Um, and one that I, that reminds you of all the things that are good in the world, um, which I think is really important. Uh, one of the neat things about it that I found when I was doing some research on this, uh, before it became a play, it was a art installation that they did where they asked people to write everything that they thought was brilliant in the world. And this is, you know, brilliant in the way that the, that the British people use that word, like brilliant. Um, and so, so those wonderful things in the world. And, uh, and then they also created a Facebook group which is still out there. You can Google it. You can find it uh, if, you, if you put uh, every brilliant thing into Facebook where people would just write a post about something that they thought is brilliant. And I highly recommend it if you, if you need a lift because you just go to this page and people are writing things that are beautiful about their day, like a rainbow over the lake I and mean, they might post a photo of it or um, uh, a, an ice cream sundae that you eat with your child or any of all of these things that are so beautiful and the play reminds us of those things which I think is really special and wonderful um, so I'm excited about this one uh, another neat thing about it is that it is going to star Will Bumfiglio who is a very well-known uh, local St. Louis actor um, and he was last seen in a production called Fully Committed that we did at the New Jersey Theater in 2019. Ellie Schwedy also directed this one. It was a really big hit for us. Um, he's a fantastic actor. And I think that the two of them are a great team and have been wanting to work on this production for a long time. So I'm really happy that, that they'll be here and joining us and doing it. Um, now you might ask yourself, what is Jewish about this play? Um, Duncan McMillan is obviously not a Jewish name. Uh, so the writers aren't Jewish and the story is not particularly Jewish. Uh, but something that Eddie started, which I think is really beautiful, is including a Takun Olam slot every year of one play that doesn't necessarily have Jew Jewish content, but that meets the, um, the idea of Takun Olam or the Jewish value of of fixing the world, or sometimes people say it's healing the world. And I think that this play um, is very much a play about healing, um, uh, about he healing from depression and finding the things that are good. So it, it fits into that idea of tikkun olam for us. All right, so the next play we have is Gloria, a life. Um, and that will be in June. So we're moving through the year quickly. Um, it'll be in June of 2023. And as you can see from the photo, it is about Gloria Steinem, the uh, feminist icon and activist Gloria Steinem. Um, it's gonna be directed by Sharon Hunter, who uh, is the artistic director of the Moonstone Theater here in St. Louis. And she, uh, this past summer, if you saw the play Dear Jack, Dear Louise, she directed that. That was a wonderful production as well. Um, 
and she'll be she'll be taking the helm of this one for us. Um, now it was written by Emily Mann. Okay. Um, written by Emily Mann, who is herself an artistic director of the McCarter Theater in New Jersey. Um, and uh, it was sort of the idea of Kathy Najimi, if you're familiar with her, she's a comedian and an actor. Um, and she, I guess, is friends with Gloria Steinem and went to Gloria and said, hey, you should do a play about your life. You should write it and you should be in it. And so they started this process of creating a play. They brought in Emily Mann, who had a lot of experience doing sort of documentary theater. She's done a lot of plays that are taken from real life events. Um, and they started writing it. And they did one reading of it where Gloria Steinem played herself. And, and uh, Gloria was like, nope, <laughs> acting is not for me. I'm not gonna do this myself. Um, so, but, but I think we should do it. And so they moved forward with the play, but they brought in um, Christine Lottie, who you see here in these photos to be in the, the original production, um, which happened in New York City off Broadway in 2018. Um, the play is really unique. Um, in that for th this one, the first half is more a little more traditional. You have Gloria and one actress will play Gloria Steinem the whole time. And then there's an ensemble of another seven actresses who play lots of other people in Gloria's life, um, including some, some notable women like Coretta Scott King and El Bella Abzug, Flo Kennedy and Wilma Mankiller. So um, lots of other activists who were working alongside Gloria during, during the time that she was really active and doing things like founding Ms. Magazine. Um, do you see them and these other, and the other actresses will take on all those different roles uh, and go through the story of Gloria's life, though really focusing on, on her work and her accomplishments um, and also her struggles that she had to achieve those things. Um, I have learned a lot about Gloria Steinem um, I didn't, you know, I'm a different generation and uh, had heard of her, but did not know all of the things that she had done and, and all of the, the struggles she had had in trying to just be a journalist as a woman at the time that she was coming up. And she faced a lot of, of trials and tribulations at that time. So the play really goes into that. Um, and the first half of it is, I would say, sort of tr traditional in that it tells the story of her life. But then um, what they call act two is a discussion. And the writers are very specific that you can't take a break. So there's no intermission. There's no break. You just go, you finish the story and you go straight into the discussion. But it's not a, a typical post-show discussion. Um, it's a talking circle. Um, and I'll, I'll come back to that in just a moment. But uh, I'm going to start, before we get to that, I'm going to share a little clip. Um, this was recorded for PBS Great Performances the, of the original production with Christine Lottie. And so we'll just watch a little clip of that. To get a taste of Gloria. My next celebrity assignment is to interview an actor and I have to meet him in the lobby of the Plaza Hotel. He's late and waiting a really long time. Finally, this assistant manager who's been eyeing me comes over. Excuse me, unescorted ladies are absolutely not allowed in the lobby. <laughs> I'm a reporter. I'm waiting for one of your guests I'm interviewing. Right. No, he's just late. He's, no, 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 he's just late. I have to, it's my job. I know it's your job. I look like a prostitute? Okay, fine. I'll wait outside the door. Hopefully I can see the actor from here. An hour passes, no success. Turns out the actor did come, didn't see me, and left. His press agent calls my editor. She stood up my client. The editor misses a deadline. I miss a paycheck I desperately need. And I worry about being permanently demoted to the ghetto of women's interest stories. About a month later, there's a demonstration of women protesting at the same Plaza Hotel because in its fancy Oak Room restaurant, Women are not served at lunchtime. Women feels the voices of women disturb men having serious conversations at lunch. Okay, I didn't join that demonstration because even though I marched for civil rights and against the Vietnam War, I thought protesting for just women was frivolous. But then I read about these women who stood up and said, 
No. You, you, have to go. Go. you will have to leave. You're blocking the door. I <laughs> you like a sign up there that says whites only. Women are persons. Women are people. Yeah. Have no intention of taking the sign down, a change in the sign. If you can get a court order to a take it down, order. Fine. You have no intention of changing your policy of segregated facilities. If you ladies are so hard up for a sandwich, we'll be glad to serve you in the tea room. In the tea oh, room, I can I can show you a tea party. Then I get another assignment to interview a celebrity who's staying at the plaza. Unescorted ladies on no, 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 listen to me, listen to me. I have every right to be here. Please? Why aren't you throwing out all the unescorted men in this lobby who might be male prostitutes? Oh. Or since I know hotel staff supply call girls to get a cut of their fee. Look at me. Maybe you're just worried about losing your commission. <laughs> I can't believe I just said that. I meet the celebrity. We have the interview. And I write my article with a sense of immense well-being. So that's a little taste of Gloria life and um, some of the things I was talking about in terms of what she had to go through and how she how she found that. But I think that scene shows us a great example of how she kind of found her voice and her willingness to speak out, even though she was already an activist. I find it really interesting that she didn't feel comfortable speaking out for women, that that didn't seemed like it was important until she realized how important it was. Um, so we see all that in the play. And then I was talking about the, the talking circle. Um, and that the talking circle is something that Gloria Steinem did um, throughout her, her career. She often would have, she would be invited somewhere to lead a lecture, but she would turn it into a talking circle, which is really a group of people sitting in a circle, um, having a conversation about whatever the topic is. So she might lead it and ask questions, but she didn't believe in sort of that more formal um, uh, hierarchical system where you have the lecturer and the people who are listening, which is what I'm doing right now. <laughs> but instead it was everybody sharing together. And so the play, it was very important to her that the play also embrace that. Um, and so, like I said, at the, the second act, without there being a break, goes straight into this talking circle um, and encourages the audience, asks the audience to say how the play has affected them or to share their own story of how, um, how they've been confronted with sexism or about a challenge that they have overcome or an issue in their life that's important. So it, it asks the audience to share. So it's not really a talk back where you talk to the actors about the show and what it was like working on it. It really wants you to engage with the issues that the play raises. Um, another cool thing is that they suggest, the authors suggest that you invite local women leaders to lead those discussions. And that's something that we're going to be doing. Um, I don't have the whole lineup together yet, but I'm going to be asking different um, uh, female leaders in our community to be coming in to lead these different conversations. And the, the second photo down here is of a talking circle at a, a production at the ART in Boston um, led by a, a local activist. So I think that will be really cool to have these different people coming in and sharing their stories in response to Gloria Steinem's story. All right, next up is The Immigrant. Um, which I will be directing. So that'll be my, my debut at the New Jewish Theater. Um, the Immigrant, this is actually the third time we have done The Immigrant. Um, we did it in 1999 and 2011, so about every 10 years. Um, but uh, it, I, the reason I think, again, I didn't, I didn't select it, but I do think it's a wonderful play, um, is that it is so universal um much i think much like fiddler on the roof which i think you know i'm always surprised um that back in arkansas at the shakespeare festival in the summertime we would do a musical every year and we did um fiddler one summer and this is in conway arkansas a very small town and i wasn't sure what people were going to make of it and it ended up being 
our biggest seller that we'd ever had. <laughs> uh, and, and I think people just love that story. And it is, and it is so universal, um, the way that the family engages and the struggles that they have, I think really appeals to so many people, even though it's a very specific story about Jewish people um, in, in the shtetl of Anatevka. And the immigrant, I think, is the same. It is a very specific story, um, actually about a real person. Um, Mark Herlick, who you've got a little photo of um, in the small corner of your screen, this is Mark. He's an actor uh, as well as the playwright. And he wrote the story about his own grandfather and his grandfather's experience of coming to the United States um, in 1909. And I think uh, through those specifics, we have something really universal and, and really identifiable. Um, this photo, this other photo here is from the New Jewish Theater production, the most recent one in 2011. So it gives a little taste of it. Um, and then here's some photos of, I said, this is about his grandfather. And so this, these, these is the actual Herlick family. Um, and that's another cool thing about the production is that it, it uses some of these photographs and this historical material. So um, Haskell Herlick, Mark's grandfather, came to the United States in 1909 when he was 19 years old. And he came in through the port of Galveston in Texas, which um, was an alternative point at those days. Most Jews came in through Ellis Island and ended up settling in New York or the East Coast. But there were a substantial amount of Jewish people who came in through Galveston and instead made their way up through the South. Um, and so there are different pockets of Jewish communities all over the South, including places in rural Missouri as well. Um, many of them settled by Jews coming in through Galveston. And in this particular story, um, uh, Haskell was fleeing Tsarist Russia, and he made his way to a really small town called Hamilton, Texas, which is southwest of Dallas. And he made his living selling bananas out of a wheelbarrow. And you can see here he is with his bananas as a young man in, in Hamilton. Um, now, eventually, he somehow strikes up a friendship with a couple named um, Ima and Milton Perry. And they are a local couple. Milton was a banker. And um, they became friends with Haskell, even though he only spoke Yiddish and uh, decided to help him out. And so they gave him a loan so that he could move up from selling bananas in a wheelbarrow to having a fruit and vegetable cart that was pulled by a horse. And then from there, he moved up to having a dry goods store. And then eventually that became Haskell Herlick's department store, which there's a photo of here. Um, now, during this time, he was able to bring over his wife, um, Matla, but she became known as Leah here in the United States. They were married. They had three children. Their youngest child was named Milton after Milton Perry, who had helped them and they become become so close to. Um, and uh, Milton is the, the father of Mark Herlick, who wrote the play. So um, it's a really cool story. It is just a four character play. So Haskell and his wife, Leah, are two of them. And then Ima and Milton are the other two. But it spans, I think it's 60 years um, over this two hour period of showing how Haskell first comes to Texas, how he's taken in and helped by them, how their relationship grows through the years. Um, and, then, and then they actually, there's, they, they don't always get along. They have a, a, a big falling out over the issue of immigration. Um, between Milton and Haskell, where Milton doesn't think that more Jews should be let into Texas and into the United States, that that immigration should stop, um, which was a view held by a lot of people in that time. Um, and Haskell, for obvious reasons, uh, disagrees with that. And I think um, the issues that the play raises are still very much present. Um, immigration is still, I mean, it's in the news just about every day of the United States dealing with how to handle immigration, who to allow in, how many, when, all of these issues. And um, I think this place shows us a really uh, positive story of people who um, uh, shared this generosity and about humanity uh, and about welcoming people who are different than you and what, what that can do for other people, but also reminds us that it's a difficult issue that we still face today. Um, so it's, it's a pretty cool, cool play like that. It was actually turned into a musical as well, which I think is kind of interesting. Um, 
we're not doing the musical version, but it, there is a musical version that with that uh, came out later um, in 2002. But when it first this, this first play was first written in 1985, and I said this was the third time we'd done it. But in 1991, it was actually the most produced play in America um, because it was just people were, loved it so much and it was so appealing to everybody. So I think that's pretty neat, and I'm excited to to get to work on it. Um, it's also personally very interesting to me because. As I mentioned, my family moved to um, Arkansas when I was seven to Little Rock, and I was part of the Jewish community there. Um, and there were many Jewish people who came in through the port of Galveston. Um, and it was very interesting getting to see that Jewish community as well as the Jewish communities in the small towns around us like Pine Bluff and McGee, um, these little towns that had each had their own synagogue and their own thriving communities um, many times. Um, this, the, uh, doing things like starting department stores, all the large department stores in Little Rock were owned by Jewish families um, around this time period. So having had that experience and, and being a Jewish person in the South, um, I think I'm excited to bring that experience to, to this production as well. All right. So that brings us to our final production of the 2023 season, which is Into the Woods. Um, one of St Stephen Sondheim's great musicals. He did the music and lyrics. And then the, the book is by James Lapine, who, or Lapine, I think it's Lapine, who was his um, frequent collaborator on, on several musicals together. Uh, it's going to be directed by Robert Quinlan. You guys, this is actually, you guys are the first to know. We haven't officially announced it yet, um, but he's just come on board to direct. Uh, and he is going to be new to St. Louis audiences. He's actually a, a good friend of mine. Um, he directed several times for the Arkansas Shakespeare Theater when I was there, and he was going to direct Into the Woods for the Arkansas Shakespeare Theater. It was actually planned for our 2020 season, which of course didn't happen with COVID. We had to cancel, and so I had been really disappointed and wanting to do it, um, and so some of you all may remember that we had um, originally when we announced our season, um, we were in this slot, we had Little Shop of Horrors, which is a, another super fun musical um, that I would have loved to have done. But not too long after we announced it, the Muni announced that they were also doing Little Shop of Horrors this summer. And as the Muni seats like 12,000 people, um, and we thought that a lot of St. Louis was going to have the opportunity to see Little Shop of Horrors. And so we decided to actually switch it out. So instead of Little Shop, we're now doing Into the Woods. Um, and again, I think at least in part because I had um, been so excited to get to produce it in Arkansas, it was just sort of top of mind when we needed to come up with a new musical. Uh, and I also feel like it's going to be a really excellent musical to do in our space at the New Jewish Theater, which I haven't really spoken about. Um, but we, if you haven't been there before, we have a fantastic black box theater um, where you can set it up in any kind of configuration. So throughout these plays that I've been talking about today, when you come to see them, each one, the theater will be set up and it, almost each time will be a different way. Um, so for example, we're doing Broadway bound in sort of a corner thrust um, in, the, in the corner of the room with audience on two sides. Um, will be in a more traditional thrust for every brilliant thing with audience on three sides. For Gloria, a life will be in the round with audiences on all sides uh, in a circle for that for that talking circle kind of moment we were talking about. Uh, I'm not sure what we're going to do for the immigrant into the woods yet. We haven't gotten there, but we have all these options, and um, and I think that'll be really really cool and a neat thing about about doing this play um, in our space and also celebrating these um, two wonderful. Jewish um, composers and musical theater artists through this production. Um, so the original production of Into the Woods came out in 1987, and here are some production photos from it. Uh, it wasn't a huge hit when it first came out. It was very successful, um, though it did come out the same year as Phantom of the Opera came out on Broadway. And so I think that that might have overshadowed it a little bit because Phantom of the Opera was just such a huge phenomenon at the time. Um, with Andrew Lloyd Webber winning all the all the Tony Awards and these things. So even with Phantom of the Opera coming out this year, that year, Into the Woods actually won Best Score 
best book and also best actress for uh, Joanna Gleason, who you can see over here in this photo. Um, so won those Tony Awards against Phantom of the Opera. So that uh, gives you a good sense of at least what the Tony voters thought of, of Into the Woods. Um, it's actually having a Broadway revival right now. Um, so it's been also very lauded and sell out shows and everything. And I think people are kind of, it's been, had a, a renaissance recently where people are really rediscovering it, how good it is. Uh, it was also turned into a Disney movie, movie a few years ago. I personally did not like the Disney movie as much as I liked the original production, um, but there's some, there's some good things in that as well. Um, and the idea from Into the Woods came about uh, James Lapine and Stephen Sondheim had just finished doing Sunday in the Park with George together. Um, which you know, is another one of their great musicals about the painter George Surratt. And they wanted another show. And um, Son uh, sorry, Lapine wanted to do something with fairy tales and Sondheim wanted to do a quest musical. And these ideas kind of came together. Um, they realized that they couldn't, the fa individual fairy tales were too short to, to take just like Cinderella or Little Red Riding Hood and turning turn that into a, a musical wasn't quite enough. And they hit on the idea of fitting all of these different fairy tales together. They actually, there's a story that um, they had imagined, they had an idea for a different, a different musical where they imagined their favorite television characters meeting each other in a hospital waiting room. Um, and so this is kind of that same idea, except instead of television characters, it is fairy tale characters and they all come in together in the forest. Um, that uh, apparently when Lapine first came to Sondheim and, and brought this, uh, brought the, the idea for the whole story together, he said, you'll never be able to musicalize this. Um, it's gonna be too difficult to turn it into a musical, which of course was a wonderful challenge for Sondheim and he did really, really beautifully. Um, now, if you don't know the plot of Into the Woods, uh, it does take many familiar fairy tale stories. You can see in this photo, we've got um, over here is Little Red Riding Hood. This is Jack from Jack and the Beanstalk. This is Cinderella. Um, and then we have our, our witch over here. She's actually the witch from several different stories. Um, the Big Bad Wolf. Uh, so we've got lots of different fairy tales mixed together within this story, but the over arching plot that they put on it is they added a new story that they created themselves of the baker and his wife. So this is this is the baker over here and here's the wife. Um, and uh, they don't, they're they're childless and they want to have a baby more than anything. And so when their wit, the witch from next door shows up and gives them that opportunity, they jump on it, um, even though they're not really sure what the consequences are going to be. And she sets them off and says, okay, I'll help you have a child if you find me these things I need. Um, and uh, that sends them off on this adventure. So there's the quest part that Stephen Sondheim wanted to include um, to find all these things. Um, I've got a little, oh, oh we're, run, we're running out of time. I'll do a really short <laughs> excerpt here um, of Into the Woods. Really good work. Yeah. Hope it's not happening. Sorry guys. Yep. Once upon a time. This is the opening of Into the Woods and it introduces you to all the characters. Lived a fair maiden, a sad young lad, and a childless baker. I wish with his wife. Some milk I wish we had a job. The corn girl's mother had died. You see your mother? Yes, your mother. Yes, your mother. Your father had taken for his new wife. A best of all. A woman with two daughters of her own. All three were beautiful of face, but vile and black of heart. Jack, on the other hand, had no father and his mother. Right, so just a little bit of that. Um, and uh, ooh, sorry. Uh, to give you a taste of, of Into the Woods. 
Um, it, I think one of the cool things about it is that, as I said, we'll be doing it in our space. So you saw in that clip from the original Broadway production, the set is really big with lots of moving pieces, lots of, there's lots of characters, there's lots of costumes. So it's really going to be a very big musical for us to produce. We're a small theater. Um, you know, a lot of our other shows are going to be smaller. This one's going to be a big challenge for us, which I'm excited about. And I also think there's room for a lot of creativity and imagination in order to make it work in our space with the resources that we have. So it will be very different from that clip that you saw, but I think still really fun and very well done and a great show. Um, so that's what I have to share with you today. Thank you so much for your for your time um, and your attention. I hope I hope you enjoyed it and that. Uh, your appetite is whetted for a year of, of fun and diverse and eclectic theater. So thank you very much. Hey, Rebecca, thank you very much. Um, that was really a great roundup. Um, if you don't mind closing out of your slide oh, sure. and then uh, we can see if anybody has uh, any questions or comments. That was, uh, that was a lot of fun. Does anybody have any... Uh, questions they want to ask Rebecca or any comments on the, the lineup for next year? Anything? I had a couple of things I was going to ask you about, if that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, so I went to the um, Facebook page for uh, every brilliant thing. And you're right. That's a lot of fun. Yeah. Random, random stuff that brings joy to people's hearts. And um, it's, it's very cute and life affirming you know yes. it's, it's the little things it's not necessarily the big things and uh that was a good suggestion yeah. and uh the other thing i was going to tell you is that scene at the very beginning about the um the audience member who had to portray the veterinarian with the pen yeah i don't know if i personally could have done that <laughs> i think i would have just sat back down <laughs> and pretend yeah. you know that was a yeah that. i i think that <laughs> Um, part of it. And well, that's going to be something that we're going to have to figure out during wow. the show. Um, but the, what the, um, the actor stands in the audience as people come in and kind of talks to people. Right. And right. so he gets the sense of who might be more willing, you know, some people are like, yeah, let me participate. And some people right. are like, no, no, don't give me that. I don't want to do anything. So, um, so I think they get the sense of it and, and kind of pick people through that beginning part so that but hopefully I, somebody gets called I can, on who absolutely doesn't I can feel do myself it. tearing up just sitting here, you know, <laughs> at my desk. And I thought, I would just burst into tears and go sit down because that was, yeah. that was tough. And he was being great. It wasn't anything he was doing. It's just, I've done that twice in the last, you know, 10 years and it, it doesn't get easier. And you're having to put, put down a pet. Yeah, yeah it's awful. Yeah just awful and then the last thing I was going to ask you is I thought it was interesting the story you talked about so are you in ongoing communication with other theaters like the Muni to see if there is overlap or do, it, do you does that just not happen in a community and you just got to figure it out along the way um, I am I mean so I just started and and I have not been involved in a leadership position in the St. Louis Theater before this so um I wasn't for this year obviously right obviously um right. I hope that I I can be in the future but there's not really a, a mechanism in place okay. to do that so I would probably need to reach out to the other theaters to be like hey this is what I'm thinking of does this does this conflict with you? And I think, you know, when you're the Muni, you kind of do whatever you want. <laughs> um, you know, if I was like, but I wanted to do Little Shop, I don't think they would change their mind. No. Um, but uh, uh, it would be helpful. You know, I think that if I was like, hey, I was thinking of this, does this conflict with you? They would probably tell me. Um, and so that's something I probably would look to be doing in the future. But there's not a system in place. It'd be nice if there was. Because yeah, there are so many theaters. Right. Um, and then for actually, at, right after we announced Into the Woods, like days after um, another theater company in town, um, uh, now I'm blanking on which one it was, but another theater company announced that they are also going to be doing Into the Woods this year. So it's not the Muni and they're all very small theater space. So I, I'm not as worried about the conflict because not as many people will go see it, but I still was like, ah, oh, you know, so hard. But I think um, there are only so many shows. And and I think um, Stephen Sondheim is very much in the consciousness right now since he had, he passed away recently. Right. And um, so, you know, great minds, I guess. Oh, it's Stray, Stray Dog Theater. Stray Dog is doing it. Oh, sure. Oh, yeah. I'm familiar with that, right. 
So okay, well that that I was just curious about what the the how the network works. So. Yeah, um, yeah, I'd like to work, make it better. <laughs> is there anyone else who has anything to say before uh, we let Rebecca go? She obviously put a lot of thought into this, and this is just a great uh, a little taste of what's to come. Oh, you've got a comment here. It says, thanks so much. I have to leave a great lineup. Looking forward to the performances. Thank so, you. Um, oh, wait, it looks like, yeah, there she is. Okay, thank thanks, Jan. Sure. Okay, so uh, I'm hoping, you know, we can do this again next year. And uh, looking forward to seeing the performances. And I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful year. Thanks, Happy New Year, everybody. Happy New Year. Thanks for joining me. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.